Election Day 94, Republicans are confident this is their biggest day in years. An official warning on the safety of that airplane involved in the Indiana crash. And in Union, South Carolina, Susan Smith's family apologizes to the town's black community. From NBC News Election Headquarters, this is NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Good evening. Well, this is it, and the counting has already started in one of the most contentious and certainly the most expensive election ever. Before the night is over, and it should be a long one, there could be a fundamental shift in the American political landscape to the right in the Senate, the House, and state houses. Based on what we're hearing from voters leaving the polls and the analyses of experts in both parties, many races are dead heats, but the Republicans do seem to be doing a good job of getting their vote out and turnout could decide the night. My colleague Brian Williams is keeping track of the polling information. He has, in fact, an overview of all of this. Brian? Tom, thank you. A lot of interesting trends and developments coming through tonight as the raw numbers of the exit polls come in from around the country. Here is what is coming through to us tonight. When we're looking at trends, issues that are important to various voters in various states, beginning, for example, in the state of Florida, we asked voters for the number one issue bothering them as they went to the polls today. It was crime followed by education education and taxes. Finally, the economy and jobs. Again, these are of the voters going to the polls today in the state of Florida. Vast differences, though, in the issues when you ask voters in another state. As we see, crime, education, taxes, and then the economy. Then going to the state of New York. The key issues to all of those going to the polls tonight in the race for New York governor. It's all pocketbook in the state of New York. Government spending, number one. Taxes, closely thereafter. The candidates personal qualifications were well down below economic issues. When this night is over, we should have a sample of about 9,000 people that we've asked after they've exited the polls how they just voted. Unfair political ads, a hot topic this year. It's been hot, almost without exception, in congressional districts around the country. Among the hottest races, if not the granddaddy of them all, Virginia Senate. Chuck Robb versus Oliver North and the independent Marshall Coleman. When asked if they thought ads in that state had been unfair, 91% of them said yes, only 9% said they had been fair. Taxes for services. Big issue, of course. Should the government spend more on taxes of your tax money to give you more services if you will be charged more? Well, in New Jersey, as voters went to the polls tonight, it was no to that. Give us less government was the message. Also, independent governors, independent voters, I should say, are going slightly Republican. If there is a decision to be made, it looks like more independents are leaning toward the Republican. Republican Party, 53 to 47 percent over the Democrats. One last note. How are Republicans voting tonight? We can tell you only at this early hour in large numbers. We have to be careful. Again, the numbers are early. More Republican voters as a block appear to be going to the polls than numbers in years past. There are more Republicans casting ballots in election places around the country. This could bode well for the GOP this evening. That's the view from up here, Tom. Thank you, Brian. We'll be seeing you from the Heights all evening long here on NBC. Polls are closed now in Kentucky and Indiana. And NBC News projects Republican Senator Richard Lugar re-elected to a fourth term in Indiana. No surprise there. And as NBC's Andrea Mitchell tells us tonight, Republicans are determined to make the Lugar win the rule, not the exception tonight. In the end, there was only one word to describe the Virginia Senate race, mean. By uh, 11 o'clock tonight, Bill Clinton's going to have excedrin headache number 10. In Florida and around the country, the Republican National Committee spent twice as much money as in past midterms to get out the vote. The Republicans uh, are very enthusiastic, spirited. Their turnout is up. Democrats have been dispirited, and their turnout is down. Seeing the warning signs, this afternoon the Clintons added a public event to their schedule to make one last pitch. It is critical that people understand that there are clear choices between going forward and going back. Mr. Clinton was focused today on one goal, getting Democrats to the polls, in particular black voters in key states like New York and Pennsylvania. So early this morning he was again calling radio stations in those states. Uh, so I wanted to do these election morning interviews more than anything else just to to encourage our citizens to get out and vote. Today's voting could mark the end of some big Washington careers. A change in congressional leadership could also bring the Clinton legislative program to a dead stop. 
By late afternoon, Republicans were already outlining their plans. My objective, and I believe the majority leader's objective, is going to be to present an alternative program, an alternative budget, an alternative vision. And the White House counterspin had already begun. Won't it be interpreted as a referendum on Bill Clinton? I don't think so. I mean, midterm elections, they're historic drops uh, in the president's party. That's a natural cycle we've seen time and time again. Tonight, the Clinton White House braced for the worst, the possibility that they had not been able to prevent a Republican rout. Tom? Andrea, what is the mood at the White House at this hour? It's pretty grim. There's sort of gallows humor because they have been talking to their operatives in various states. The president's been on the phone. They've talked to governors around the country. And they're hearing that Democrats are not turning out enough. So they're very concerned about this high Republican turnout and what it could mean. All right. Thank you very much, Andrea Mitchell, who will be at her post at the White House all night long. This is likely to be an election to remember. Why and what now? I'll be joined all evening by my colleague Tim Russert, who's moderator of Meet the Press, Washington Bureau Chief. Tim, did the Republicans do a better job of keeping this election focused on their hot-button issues? They sure did, Tom. They intensified their voters. They suggested, if you don't like Bill Clinton, let's replay the 1992 presidential race. Here's a chance to do it all over again. Let's talk about crime and taxes. He said he was a new Democrat. He wasn't. He's an old-fashioned liberal. And let's send him a message. But if the Republicans don't gain control of the House and the Senate, they're plainly positioned to make real gains. Are we in for two years of more gridlock? I think absolute gridlock. I think that both sides will dig in. We won't see much progress on any of the major issues. And I think the public will be just as angry in 1996 and perhaps even try to make a different change. But the fact is tonight, Tom, the Republicans focused their me message and are getting their voters out. Is there no signal from the country in all of this that they want something to be done? They don't want to return to gridlock. And aren't whoever is in power can be smart enough to see that. I think the Republicans are making a mistake if they think this is a vote for obstructionism. As Brian pointed out in his poll, they want something done on crime, taxes, health care, education, but to be modest and incremental and not more government. All right. Thanks very much, Tim Russett. We'll be seeing you throughout the evening here as well. You can go back to your charts and to your telephone now. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. When Nightly News continues in a moment, commuter planes and safety, an urgent warning today. Also, thunder on the right, the Christian right, how much Election Day muscle? And had enough this Election Day? Well, you're not alone. Of course, there's other news this election night, including a serious warning about the safety of some commuter planes in this country following last week's crash in Indiana. What federal investigators want is to keep some of those planes from flying in certain kinds of weather. Here's NBC's Robert Hager. ATR turboprops. There are 156 flying for short-haul airlines in the U.S., but now they face a threat of being grounded when there's a chance of any icing at all. The Federal Aviation Administration said today it's giving urgent consideration to that, even though it could disrupt flying on any cloudy winter day. In the Midwest, for instance, where American Eagle uses a majority of its 71 ATRs for flights between Chicago and 27 other cities. American Eagle also uses some in the Northeast. And Continental Express flies 44 ATR turboprops, many from hubs in Cleveland and Newark. After last week's ATR crash in Indiana, Investigators now believe that in spite of anti-icing devices on the front of the wings, ATRs are more vulnerable than other planes to a buildup of ice behind those devices, interfering with the flow of air over the wing and causing the plane's steering devices to suddenly pop up or even flip the plane over. The FAA said today it's assembling test pilots and engineers to go back to the drawing board, re-examining its vulnerability to ice and suggesting modifications in design. Meantime, the FAA says it'll order air traffic controllers to give special handling to ATR craft, assigning them to fly underneath ice or around it, and in the case of weather holds, ordering them to the front of the line. Memorial services today, one in Indianapolis and this one outside Chicago, both to remember all the victims of Flight 4184. 68 people lost their lives in the crash. Robert Hager, NBC News, Washington. It was two weeks ago tonight that Michael and Alex Smith disappeared in Union, South Carolina. And today, members of the Smith family spoke out emotionally. NBC's Kenley Jones is there tonight. David Smith Sr., the grandfather of the two slain children, said his son is still distraught over the murders of young Michael and Alex. He's broken up. He wants his children back. That can't happen. The brother of Susan Smith, 
the mother who first said a black man kidnapped her children before confessing that she killed them, apologized to Union's black community. Uh, it's, it's really disturbing for us to think that, that anyone would think that this was ever a racial issue. At a memorial service for the children last night, a black minister called for a statement from the family and law enforcement officials acknowledging that a false accusation was made against a black man. That they understand that because of the fact that the accusation was made, it did hurt some people very, very deeply. There is still some lingering resentment here that Susan Smith's story that a black man took her children was given credence far too long. As one member of the black community put it today, we accept the apology, but we won't forget it. Kenley Jones, NBC News, Union, South Carolina. Disaster tonight for a Chicago pastor's family on a road trip while his church was used as a polling place today. Their van burst into flames after road debris punctured the gas tank. Five children died, ages six weeks to 11 years. The parents and a 13-year-old son are hospitalized in critical condition tonight. News now from the O.J. Simpson trial. The Los Angeles District Attorney said that Simpson's friend Al Collings would not be charged with helping him flee in that white Bronco before Simpson finally was arrested. The DA said there was insufficient evidence. More violence tonight in the battle over abortion, and this time it's in Canada. A doctor who performs abortions in Vancouver was shot and wounded at his home today by a gunman using a high-powered rifle. The doctor is in serious but stable condition tonight. When we come back here in a moment, California's hot-button issue illegal immigrants. Back to politics now and another big sign of voter discontent this year, a record number of individual issues placed directly on the ballot. One of the most controversial, California's immigration initiative, Proposition 187. More now from NBC's George Lewis. The initiative, which would deny schooling and other social services to illegal immigrants, sparked student protests again today in Los Angeles and in San Francisco, where marchers converged on City Hall. Police agencies in Southern California have gone on tactical alert in case the demonstrations, which have been peaceful so far, turn violent. Uh, over the last 10 days, uh, we've had uh, literally hundreds of protests. Uh, there is great sensitivity. Proposition 187 has polarized voters in this state who are either strongly for the measure or strongly against it. We should be um, penalizing the employers and this is where the problem is, I feel. I don't feel the kids are the problem. The foreigners, they go down and they can get all the services they want. You go down there and ask for services and you can't. It has become the issue in the governor's race. Pete Wilson, a 187 supporter, is pinning his re-election hopes on anti-immigrant sentiment. We are going to take back California for the working, tax-paying families of this state but the opponents of Proposition 187 have been very active in recent days, trying to turn out the no vote. According to pollsters, the measure, which enjoyed a two-to-one lead at one point, is now almost dead even in some polls. A heavy voter turnout is thought to be good for the opponents of 187. But because of bad weather in Southern California, turnout has been on the light side so far. If the initiative passes, the opponents say not only will there be more demonstrations, they'll try to block the measure in the courts. George Lewis, NBC News, Los Angeles. Of course, immigration is not the only thing that voters are deciding directly today. There are 77 other referendum questions on ballots across the country this year. That's the most in half a century. And three big issues dominate this year. Term limits, gambling, and what voters describe as their number one concern, crime. There are anti-crime measures on the ballot in six states, including California's three strikes and you're out, mandatory life sentences for three-time felons. In Milwaukee, voters will decide on a proposed total ban on handguns. With the voters mad as hell, term limits are on the ballot in eight states and the District of Columbia. The measures range from a forced retirement plan after 12 years for state officials to a two-term limit for members of Congress and the Senate. Gambling, also a hot issue. Eight states voting on whether to legalize or expand casino and riverboat gambling with an eye toward creating thousands of new jobs and new tax revenue. 
Also on the ballot today, measures that would require voters to approve any new taxes in three states, and in two others, proposals that would make it tougher for state legislatures to impose new taxes. On the flip side, two states asking voters to slap a new tax on tobacco to fund health care. Then there is Vermont with a kinder, gentler, politically correct proposal. It eliminates nine instances where the word he appears in the state constitution, making the Green Mountain state gender neutral. Wall Street on this election day. The Dow gained almost 22 points in heavy trading. The Nasdaq Composite also up more than five points. Trading today was active. When we come back in a moment, power on the right. The moralists mobilized for political change. If the trend that we're seeing toward a heavy Republican turnout holds up, the Christian right will have a lot to do with it. An estimated 2 million calls to get out the vote today, 30 million self-styled voter guides distributed in churches across the country this past weekend. On the political watch tonight, national correspondent Bob Kerr now. If you think you're mad as hell at government, Laura Neal is madder, and she's doing something about it. All right, just because he felt that way doesn't mean it was really true, though. Concerned about school curriculum and values, she decided to teach her two kids at home near Charleston, South Carolina. Her husband, Bob, also spends extra time at home, turning his computerized list of 600 like-minded neighbors into a potent political force. The Neals were surprised to discover how many were as fed up as they were and willing to act on it. We are the silent majority. Let's not have government come in and impose upon us what are the right values. In a recent poll, voters like Bob Neal are described as moralists, defenders of traditional moral values. Mainly white and middle-aged, they call themselves religious conservatives, an estimated 27 million registered voters, one in five. So far, most of the movement's success has been limited to electing candidates to local office. The challenge and the goal is to channel moral passion into mainstream national politics. The tactic de-emphasize abortion, school prayer, censorship, issues that can project an image of intolerance and stress instead crime, education, welfare, and their connection to the breakdown of families. Our people are becoming more um, politically savvy, they're understanding the issues and they're able to articulate the issues um, in a way that's non-threatening. Cindy Costa is the business manager for her husband, Charleston plastic surgeon Louis Costa. Those that do represent that extreme end of our religious conservative pool are no more representative of the mainstream of what religious conservatism is than the Black Panthers represented the essence of the civil rights movement in the 60s. Religious conservatives dominate the Republican Party in three states and are an increasing factor in many more. Still, many wonder whether the movement begun by Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell can repackage itself enough to go beyond preaching to the choir and begin adding converts. Bob Kerr, NBC News, Charleston, South Carolina. One prominent Democrat commenting on all of this said, it's hard to complain when we've had so much help from black churches over the years. When we come back here in a moment, the cry of a weary electorate, thank God it's over. Tonight there will be gracious concession speeches and generous victory celebrations, pledges from winners and losers to do what's right for the nation. Too bad there wasn't more of that during the campaign, which was somewhere between mud wrestling and a street fight. Now, thankfully, it is over. NBC's Roger O'Neill says the end came just in time. It's been in your face morning, noon, and night. Thankfully, time zone by time zone, it's over with tonight. No more signs, ads, and slogans. Information on Gail Norton and a piece of candy for you. With tape and staples and nails, every post and sign and pole has been plastered with the likes of Ritter, Schroeder, and Linkart. It never ends. The candidates have been out early, they've jumped up and down, even dressed in funny costumes. It's just politics, but whether we are amused or feel abused by it all, they still stand on street corners and wave to us, even though we don't wave back. It seems so much worse this year. Candidates are aware of this national mood that they've been reading about, that everyone is angry, 
angry at them and they're looking at ways to, to get around that anger and I don't know that that actually being in, in people's face all the time is a way to do that. I don't think it's very effective. It's also been a dirty campaign. Knows a lot about pork and perks. He's secretive, threatening, greedy. 60% of all political advertising this season has been negative, according to the industry's expert. And yet the politicians wonder why the electorate is so negative. Across the country, the candidates have spent $200 million to get their politics out. Finding peace of mind has been darn near impossible. It's everywhere, even on country. That's not what our small town needs. What the town needs is a rest. A Cherry Creek Dodge, a After this election, Deal and Doug, who hawks new cars, may move up a notch or two on the who do you trust scale. That's a promise, because if we can't meet or beat any bona fide deal, I'll personally give you the car. Roger O'Neill, NBC News, Denver. That's nightly news for now, but a reminder, we will have updates throughout the evening on this NBC station, and we'll be back with Dateline NBC, an election special tonight at 10, 9 central time. I'll be joined by Jane Pauley, Tim Russert, and Brian Williams, and the entire NBC News political staff. I'll see you then.